Thank you, Natasha. Um, so today's agenda for us, we're going to start with a quick poll um, to make sure everybody's um, awake during this lunch hour, uh, if you're in the East Coast, that is, if not in the morning for the rest of us. Um, and then we're going to switch to a personal story from me and get us to understand why is our need for systems thinking? Um, what is this systems thinking and systems dynamics and who are what is who is a systems leader? who are system stakeholders. Um, we're going to go through an example of a change process as well as um, an example of how relationships and systems thinking can be used to leverage um, to solve social problems. And then we're going to go on to the most exciting part of the webinar for me, which is um, Cara's story through Newcomer Kitchen. And then we'll give um, you guys um, an idea of what are the resources and tools that we'll be sending you afterwards, and then wrap it up and open up to more discussions and questions. So we're just going to get started. Oops. Sorry. We're going to go into the poll. So if I could, perfect. So if you guys can um, answer um, the question of, do you consider yourself to be part of a family? Um, it would be fantastic. So if you can just use a yes or no and click on it. We, um, we, yeah. yeah, as we are seeing lots of people already voting and 100% yes. Perfect. We're just going to get three more seconds. Yep, we're still at 100% yes. There's nobody that doesn't consider themselves to be part of the family. Perfect. So now we're going to go to the next and the last question, I promise. Which is, have you ever witnessed a family member, this could be yourself or someone else, um, say or do something that had unintended consequences? So and maybe you or someone else said something or did something um, and there were unintended consequences that occurred as a result. Say somebody's feelings got hurt or, um, yeah. All right, well, it looks like lots of votes are coming in. And so far, actually, only we have 99% who said yes, um, and 1% said no. I'm curious about that one. <laughs> <laughs> have you said no? Maybe chat your, uh, chat your, type your response in through the chat box. Perfect. So, as, as any family, um, or in most cases, we'll dig into that one in the future. Um, but um, unfortunately, or fortunately, we, there are many behaviors that we have that may have unintended consequences. And it doesn't only happen in families. It happens in communities and countries and around our globe. So I'm going to go into personal story by me, or but, um, there you go. So I was originally born in Shemiran, which is the north part of the capital city of Iran, which is Tehran. And this was a place with gardens. And my childhood was basically about climbing fruit trees and playing with my cousins and friends. And these gardens were where I had fruit in the summer and I played with snow and yes, we had snow in Tehran um, in the winter. And every few years I would go, more and more of these gardens would turn into high risers and big buildings. To the point that last November when I wanted to go to Iran, my dad actually didn't let me because he said there was a lot of pollution and a lot of people have died this month. And I didn't really believe it. So I decided to Google it because that's what I would do. And this is what Tehran looked like. Um, the death um, rates have been rising every year. The last stat that I could find was 180 per day in 2015. In November that I was trying to go, about 412 um, were reported dead in just 23 days. And if so, we, if we think about it from the unintended consequences side of things, um, Nobody in that city ever got together and said, let's make sure that we got the most polluted city in the world or the second most polluted city in the world. However, everybody contributed to it. So, so who is responsible for this? Is it the officials? Is it the regulators? Is it the re residents? 
why does the city look like this right now? And so, and this is what it looks like at night. Yes, we even have traffic jams at 2 in the morning. Um, and so the government put in things like um, banning cars, so having even cars on one day and odd cars on another day on highways. Um, and all that did is make people buy more cars, one with an um, even license plate, one with an odd license plate, um, and various other things that really, frankly, just looked at the system. And this is not just one complex social and environmental problem in the world, as we all know. There are many. And there are many solutions that have come up, and many of these solutions have not been working. There was about $2.5 trillion of shortfall just to meet the needs of social, environmental, and economic problems in the developing countries. And the solutions that are um, being implemented um, are looking at it from singular intervention. And they're looking at symptoms, such as um, giving HIV AIDS um, medication instead of looking at why are people getting this and how do we and they're having um, unintended negative consequences similar to what you guys have been experiencing or seeing in the past. So systems thinking is really looking at how do we go to really understand these problems. And it's going from linear thinking to complex systems thinking. Let me think, what is a system? A system is an entity um, with interrelated and inter interdependent parts it is defined by its boundaries, and it is more than the sum of its parts. Changing one part of the system affects other parts and the whole system with predictable patterns of behaviors. So an example of a system is every single one of you guys, and your families, and your car. And systems thinking is really about understanding the relationships of systems and how they affect each other, both negatively and positively. And this can really help us understand um, the natural processes in the world and how our behaviors affect these. And system dynamics is looking at complex systems instead of just simple systems. And in systems approach to a problem, you can start by realizing that there is no inherent end to a system. There's no such thing as finding a complete theory. The quest is to look at a problem more comprehensively. So, as in other words, um, systems can't be controlled, but they can be designed and redesigned. We can surge forward with certainty into a world of no surprises, but we can expect surprises and learn from them and even profit from them. We can't impose our will upon systems. We can listen to what the system tells us and discover how its properties and our values can work together to bring forth something much better than could ever be produced by our will alone. And we can't control systems or figure them out, but we can dance with them. And I'll tell you about the dance later. So in order to kind of start us to understand sort of what is this about, we're going to go through a simple model. This is an iceberg model, which is one of the many models that we will be sending you in the future. Um, and we're going to look at a simple example, which is caching a cold. So if I caught a cold, the event of me catching a cold. Um, if I want to look at it from solving, um, from looking at the symptom, I would take Advil cold and I'll feel better shortly. And then that cold will come back. But if I want to dig deeper understand the systemic changes that I can make, I need to look at the patterns. So what are the trends that are happening? Um, I could see that when I'm sleeping less, I get cold or when I'm stressed out. Then looking at the underlying structures. So what has influenced these patterns? What are the relationships between the parts? So when I'm stressed out at work, when I'm not eating well, when I'm diff having difficulty accessing healthy food near home or work. And then finally digging deeper into the mental models. What are the assumptions, beliefs, values that people hold about the system? What beliefs keep the system in place? And this goes beyond just me as an individual. My, so career is something important, healthy food is expensive, rest is for lazy, unmotivated people, and so on and so forth. So 
So this helps us to dig deeper as to why we are in the situation that we are. So a systems leader is, or let's go back to what, what is lead. So lead comes from to body an ancient understanding of leadership, the Indo-European root of lead, or lead, I think is how you pronounce it, literally means to step across a threshold and to let go of whatever might limit stepping forward. And systems leader are not the ones that think, sing, are not singular heroic figures, but those who facilitate the conditions which others can take, make progress towards social change. So they're the ones that create the space. And they can be anybody. They don't need to be in, in a position of authority. They can be in any sector, in any organization, in any formal or non-formal um, position. And so you may wonder, what are the characteristics of these people? These people see the larger picture beyond themselves. They build their relationships by really, really listening and opening up their minds and their hearts and reflecting on what they hear and they see and being adaptive to what comes to them and not authoritative and taking time to understand um, what's happening and understand that they need to create a balance between plans and the space. In fact, they're the yin and yang of leadership. And they need to shift the collective focus from reactive to co-creating and not for, wait for a fully developed plan, um, but to have the freedom and give the freedom for people to step forward, um, try and learn by doing. And they know that there is no easy answer that these are complex problems and we need to cultivate the conditions to try and work on it together. So this is one of my favorite quotes that kind of helps understand um, what do we mean by this. And it's from an old, um, I believe it's a Chinese philosopher that says, a wicked leader is the one um, who people despise. The good leader is the one who people revere. The great leader is the one who the people say, we did it ourselves. And so the last one is really what the idea of system thinking is about, it's creating that condition. And so if we think about leaders, one of them is Nelson Mandela. And he's someone who really took the time to listen and learn from the people that disagreed with him and open up his heart and his mind. And when he got out of jail, one of the biggest things that he did from a systems thinking point of view is create a truth and reconciliation com um, commission. And this was really a radical in innovation in the country's emotional healing and collective future planning. So it helped people on all sides, black, white, etc., heal together and take responsibility and accept what happened in the past but together really build a future. And if we look back at how he did it and the way he did it, and he wasn't the only person, as there were many, many others, such as Bisman, Desmond Tutu and former president, the clerk, um, these are the characteristics that really helped let this forward. And here's a dance that I told you guys about. So systems leader and people in the system are the ones that really understand the system, understand different people in the system, and have the long, long-term view and learn how to change this and move forward together. And now you're thinking, who else is in this system besides the leader? And the stakeholders in the system are people and organizations that affect or are affected by the issue, anyone that can make a contribution to the effort, and anyone that can possibly derail the effort that is not on board. So it can be any flurry of people from nonprofits to governments to schools to etc. So let's go through an example of what this change may look like. And I have put one of my favorite quotes in the world, which is be the change you wish to see by Mahatma Gandhi. So the original on the left is from Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, which talks about um, understanding where the current reality is, which is at the bottom, understanding 
where the future, the future vision is. And understanding that this tension in between is where our gap is and where we need to change. And that has been taken in the System Thinking for Social Change, which is a fantastic book that I really recommend you guys all to read it. Kind of takes this and goes further and says, okay, in order for us to do that, we need to first build a foundation all together, bring our stakeholders together, really understand why and how are we where we are, and then together build what does this future look like. And then after we know where we are and where we're trying to go, then we sit down together and decide, okay, how do we go from where we are to where we're trying to go? And so if you're saying this is nice at a hypothetical side, we're going to go deeper. And again, it's not that deep. So if you want to learn more um, in the book, there's, I think, one or two chapters on each one of these sections. So they go through examples and they go through various different parts. But we're going to give you a kind of a taste of it. So the first part, which is build a foundation for change, is where we identify who are these stakeholders. And then we build a common ground as to understand where everybody is and where they want to go and build a rough idea as to what does this future look like. And here is when we start to talk about um, building capacities to collaborate and bringing in the systems thinking ways uh, for people to understand. Then we go to the second part, which was at the bottom, um, which is understanding the current. The why are we here? And this is really, really, really important because this is an iceberg. And it's not just one person's iceberg, it's everybody's iceberg. And really going deeper into what's happening. And this may include interviewing different people. So if you're looking at something like homelessness, looking at the homeless population as well as everyone else in this community that's related. And then improving the data and the information that we have getting better understanding as to what's happening and understanding the people's mental models, their behaviors, their thoughts. And after we understand where we are, we can then together build what could be the future. And this future has both, looks both at what are the benefits and the costs. So we're looking at what are the benefits of um, building something in the future and what are the costs? And on the other side, what are the benefits and the costs of what we currently have? So for example, if we're looking at homelessness and we have um, temporary housing, um, what are the benefits and costs of that versus building something more permanent that's safe, that gives the services that people want, um, et cetera, et cetera. And based on both of those, then we would, um, as a group, decide what is the future that we all deeply wish to create. And after that future is created is when the fun part starts. And it's where we're bridging the gap between um, proposing and refining that high level intervention, um, deciding who's going to do what, um, what are the metrics, how are we going to um, monitor this, um, how are we going to track it, how are we going to fund it, and then making sure that we're continuously learning and changing and modifying based on what we learn because the plan that we originally come up with is probably not going to be to the dot exactly what's going to happen. So we need to be flexible. And also keep in mind that there's three openings needed for these changes to happen. Opening of the mind, the heart, and the will. And without these, it will be really, really, really difficult for these changes to happen and every single person needs to commit to these. So, now we're gonna go to a story of relationships and systems thinking to solve social problems. And this is, um, this actually um, is an old idea, which um, is about circles and circle talks. And the way they work is that people sit in a circle they have a stick, a talking stick, and it gets passed around. And only the person with a stick is allowed to talk. And everyone else has to actually listen with open minds, open hearts, um, and really understand. And it is a way to value everyone and show their importance. 
and make sure that they come to an agreement together. And usually what's shared in the circle doesn't leave the circle in the original idea. And you're used to thinking, how is this related to what we're saying? So this idea of circles, which was first found in Native American cultures of US and Canada, which really extensively was used in Yukon, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, if you don't know where that is, it is in Canada. Um, its first adaptation to the criminal justice system was in 1980s and then 1992. And then the best known example, which I have the link for, um, which you guys can see later, um, is from the Hollow Water First Nations community, holistic healing used for high level of alcoholism. So they were trying to understand why is there so much alcoholism. And then when they dug deeper into those um, icebergs, they realized that a lot of it comes from sexual abuse. Um, and so then they started to deal with how do we get people to heal and how do we get not only the individuals but the community to heal from this. And so this was taken to um, an organization called Roca Inc., which is in the U.S., and their mission is to disrupt the cycle of incarceration and poverty by helping young people transform their lives. So they had been doing this work for a really long time, but in 2000, they learned about the peacemaking circles from um, practice from, I'm going to butcher this name, Tajish um, Glikik, I apologize for mispronunciation probably, um, people in the Yukon territories, and they started to use and apply it to diverse settings from street conflicts to sentencing, to parole circles, they kind of used it everywhere, like Iranians use salt. Um, and what as a result was, in 2013, they realized that 89% of, um, of their paroles and ex-convicts had um, no new arrests, 95% had no new, no new technical violations, 69% remained employed. And so Massachusetts entered into a $27 million social impact bond with ROCA, where ROCA will be paid to keep at-risk youth out of prison, receiving remuneration directly in proportion to the positive outcomes they achieve. If you guys don't know what social impact bonds are, when we send the links, you can go and look at our social finance webinar and learn all about it. So, this is an example of one of their peacemaking circles. And I really love this quote that says, we learn to listen to each other in a deep way in circles. This came from the youth worker, um, Omar Ortez. You see that a problem is not just one person's problem. It is all our problem. And this is the various different organizations that they include. Um, from the criminal justice system to the police, et cetera, to help make sure that they solve this problem holistically. And together, um, so the way that it works for them, they bring in volunteers, victims, victims' families, offenders, um, community concern, et cetera, and they sit in the circle. And it's a value-driven process combined by with meditation and um, the circle, as we mentioned, to make sure that everybody heals and understands, and as a community, they heal together and move forward. And um, as a result, the offender shares why or how he committed a crime. The victim shares how um, they were affected by economically, physically, and emotionally, and they build a strategy for addressing the crime. And they also went further and built a whole flurry of our programs that I'm not going to go into detail of, um, but it is um, a program that really lets the youth know that somebody will be there. Somebody is there to build a relationship with them. These people are usually the only adults that are consistent in these youth's lives. Um, they changed their programming and tailored each individual's needs they engage the institutions and they check their own performance and learn and, and modify as they need to so that they can solve this problem and help the communities. So now we're going to move to the exciting part of the story and 
um, which is the story of Newcomer Christian. And the reason why I really like the story is because it started in a very simple, organic way. And slowly but surely, um, this turned into a big change. So I will not give more away. And I will ask um, Kara to um, start with, can you tell us about what is this Newcomer Kitchen? How did you guys start? Um, and yeah, we'll take it from there. Hi, Asmund. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Well, I'd like to uh, thank you so much for having me come and uh, speak uh, to your audience today. Uh, right now, we are in the middle of Newcomer Kitchen. It's a Thursday morning. This is when we have Newcomer Kitchen. And um, so right above my head, there's uh, 12 amazing women uh, hustling and bustling around in the kitchen and uh, making food. But I want to tell you a little bit about how we started. And the origin story of Newcomer Kitchen is that first and foremost, it was a gesture of hospitality. The place where Newcomer Kitchen started, the Depaneur, is used to inviting strangers into its kitchen. The values of um, opening up our space to the community was baked right into the DNA of the Depaneur. The Depaneur is in Toronto, Canada. It's a tiny little event space, food hub incubator in the west end of Toronto. Uh, and I think it's important because it speaks to the underlying values and how they inform action and how they support and direct decisions and how those decisions are made down the line. So your change doesn't happen in a vacuum and it builds and it nudges and it develops from something that already exists. And when external conditions begin to shift, certain kinds of people look to see how they can rearrange those pieces and make a new iteration, a different kind of pattern. But we can't deny the foundations on which we build. So Len Senator, who owned that Depaneur, opened it six years ago, and it was really supposed to be a, a, a bit of a playroom. You know, he had been in the marketing business. He decided that at a certain point in his life, he wanted to change and follow his passion, and food was his passion. So he opened up the Depaneur, a lot of challenges in terms of, um, you know, regulatory bodies, zoning, you know, so many different aspects. And so he created something that sort of got around all the regulatory requirements that we couldn't actually meet and uh, opened up the stores. And so for six years, we have different events every single day of the year. And um, I had gotten involved. Uh, now, Len, Len um, had come from Montreal. And uh, so the name Depaneur means the corner store in Montreal. And it also means the fixer. And it's the idea is, is that if you have a problem in the community, you go to the Depaneur and he or she will find solutions to problems. So, and Alain had been a friend of mine for a long time. Uh, I had gotten involved in his workshop, in the cooking workshops here, a big bread baker. And um, so one day when the Syrian refugees were first arriving in Canada and they were um, being housed in hotels, uh, there was simply a um, newspaper article that was, was beginning to share their story about how they, they were getting a little frustrated. They wanted to do something and they wanted to start moving out into the community. And so, you know, we said to each other, well, what do we have to share? What can we do? And we said, well, we have a kitchen. So uh, simply as a gesture of inviting uh, Syrian women to come and cook with, um, you know, no, no more sort of intent than that. I had been involved in cooperatives, uh, community kitchens, and so I had a little bit of background on how to, you know, how to run something like this. So on a very cold March day, you know, with an hour's notice, you know, 12 women and their children came to the Depaneur, and there was one young couple with them that spoke English. They too were refugees. And, um, you know, at first when they sat down and they really didn't know where they were, it was the very first time that they had ever gone anywhere in Canada. And um, Len was busy trying to gesture wildly to explain that all we wanted to do was to have them cook for the afternoon and take the food home to, to their families. And when the penny finally dropped, when they finally understood that, you know, that's all we were doing. We were simply sharing what we had. That, you know, I remember they sort of threw off their coats, and as I like to say, they threw themselves into our lives. And at the end of that day, we shared an amazing meal, um, and we knew we had to do it again. We knew that we were, we had already bonded completely. And um, 
it was such a good time, and the food was so amazing, and they were so happy. And they were telling us that it was the first time for some of them, for some of the women that for four years they hadn't had a kitchen, and they hadn't been able to come together as women. And, you know, in the Middle East, cooking is a very social event, and for women coming together with other women, it's, it's, it's part of the fabric of who they are and their identity. So we decided to do it again, and we did it the next Thursday, and then the next Thursday, and we continued to do it. And uh, eventually, the Syrians did find their own homes, and they came back to us, and they said, you know, we still want to do it. Like, it's so much fun. It means so much to us. And so we decided to offer the fact that, you know, maybe we could take some of this food, and we could patch it up, and we could make little suppers, and we could sell it online. Because one of the things that the Depener already had was an amazing uh, website, uh, back-end e-commerce, we had 5,000 people on our mailing list and Facebook. We already had a community to, to build this kind of like nascent social enterprise. So they'd never done anything like this before, but we thought, why not? We'll just try it. So first, first Thursday, it was 25 meals, then it was 30 meals, and then 50 meals. And uh, immediately, it was, it was an instant success. We sold out immediately, and then every week. And so from that Thursday until, in fact, this Thursday, we have been doing this Thursday pop-up with the de with the definer. Um, the press got hold of the story. It was such a good field of story, and the community started to come in the doors. and And before we knew it, like we, you know, we were kind of like a well-known little part of the Toronto landscape. And we started getting catering um, offers, and we'd never done anything like that before. But we thought, okay, we can we can try. And um, so I'd like to move into some of our little pictures here. I've, I've just uh, added a couple of pictures. Uh, this is Len sitting at his computer. This is where he lives. You know, without the uh, incredible um, savvy social media and marketing that Len had already applied to the Depreneur, we really would never have nested into uh, those uh, skill sets that he brought ultimately as a stakeholder in Newcomer Kitchen. So he's upstairs in that very corner now making sure that the orders are online and that they'll be delivered uh, in time. And uh, from the very beginning of our project, Foodora, which is a big international food delivery company, uh, bicycle delivery, had came, came to us and said, we'd love to support your project. And so every single week they deliver all the meals for free to our customers. Next slide, please. This is uh, just some of the ladies sitting around. It's always about the chatting. So what we discovered was is that you know that it was more than just the cooking. It was about them being able to have a space, a safe space where they could share their stories with each other, uh, ultimately share their stories with us, and ultimately they start sharing their stories with the world. But it was because we were around that table and we were cooking and we were using our hands and we were doing what we loved that allowed that. Um, sense of safety to to uh, engage them in in opening up and being able to sort of see themselves not only from where they came from but to give them a sense of where they were going so next slide please so this is Rahaf al Fani. She's she was the young woman that first brought uh, the first group of Syrian ladies to us. She's a fantastic cook. She's our kitchen lead. And then uh, the gentleman on the left actually is a Syrian who came and started his own Syrian bakery. So before long, we started to have professional chefs in the city coming and hanging out and wanting to learn and share, you know, what they had in terms of their knowledge. Next slide, please. So at, when we started to sell the meals, we, we, we were trying to explain to the women that this was going to be sort of like a small entrepreneurial model. So we sold the meals online, we got the money, we took off the, the cost of the groceries, and then we divided the rest of the money by the women who were in the room. And so this is our little chalkboard, which is now outside um, with, our, with our daily meal. But that was our little math that we, we would do with the ladies every, every Thursday. Next slide. Um, so we started to get uh, invitations to do big festivals and big events in the city. And so Luminato is a big cultural event in the city. And they reached out to us and said, we'll give you a tent for free. You know, we love your project. And, but you have to make 1,500 uh, satires, which are like these small pizzas and dessert. We'd never done anything like that before. So there was a big uh, food um, production facility in Toronto. We called them up. And they invited us all in, although we didn't have proper professional training. And there we are, actually in the middle of Ramadan. And, uh, you know, it was really like landing on Mars. But we all just decided we can do this. And we did. So next slide, please. 
this is us. Uh, and, and we have 60 women now in our program. And so when you see slides, you have to understand that there are 60 different women who, who all sort of pick and choose when they come to participate in the different events that, that we do. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, we decided that we were going to launch a brunch. And uh, it was the first Syrian uh, brunch in Canada. It was uh, reviewed by Silver Magazine as one of the best brunches in Canada. But here we are all around the table trying out different uh, recipes. And all the ladies have brought different recipes. And the gentleman on the left is one of Toronto's top chefs who's, who's come to ostensibly advise us, but actually he said, I'm learning more than I'm sharing. And he was busy uh, tasting food there. So next slide, please. Uh, and then we decided that the ladies needed the food handler certification so that we really could go into professional kitchens. And so we piloted the first ever Arabic language food handlers um, um, training program. Next slide. I think there's another slide there. Yeah, and here we all are. So 24 women have gone through and received their certification. And, you know, that was a really big step for them because they felt like they had really achieved something and they had you know, uh, a stake in uh, both, you know, both a potential career for them, but also, um, you know, that it, 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 it gave them a sense of, you know, um, the first step in Canada. So, next, uh, next slide. Okay, this is us out on another adventure. We call them Mahumaras, that's the uh, adventure in Arabic. And really the point is, is that everywhere we go and all the different amazing opportunities that we have for both social and economic, uh, you know, um, engagement is that, you know, we've come to be friends, we've come to trust one another, and wherever we go, we go uh, with smiles on our faces, and we always get smiles in return, and uh, it's really that uh, we've brought together the community, both the Canadians who volunteer endlessly, I think maybe the next slide is some volunteers. Hopefully your next slide is volunteers. Next slide, please. Ah, no, this is, um, there's our volunteer. We have an amazing uh, contingent of uh, volunteers that help us at every single level of our organization. And um, without them, I don't think we could really have pulled off what we did. Um, and now we find that, uh, you know, we have Canadians that volunteer in our organization. We have the community who are our customers. We have small business where we pop in uh, using their latent capacity in their kitchens. And uh, we now have Corporate Canada, and they're supporting us both uh, in their corporate kitchens, but also through team building workshops and uh, monetary support. Um, so it's really, a, it's really come together as a group stakeholder engagement. So, being conscious of time, um, yeah. we um, can you tell us maybe about um, a minute yeah. or max minutes and a half, and tell us a little bit about um, some of the partnerships that you guys have built, um, as you guys didn't really do the typical nonprofit work, and um, tell us a little bit about those partnerships and how you leveraged it. Well, in um, uh, October of 2016, we, came, we registered as a not-for-profit um, so that we could go after government funding. Um, that has been a slower, uh, more difficult process than we imagined, but we're certainly there now. And so we have our first grants, and we're starting to open up a second location in a different part of the city, uh, and uh, we're starting to like spread that engagement. I think one of our challenges is, is that you know our growth has been so quick. And um, trying to manage that growth, both in terms of sort of um, um, the financial aspect, the bookkeeping aspect, the development of the board, uh, everything has all come together at the same time. Also, the fact that because we've had so much remarkable press, both nationally and internationally, that I get letters from all over the world, like every single week, saying we want to start a newcomer kitchen in our own community. And so our goal besides you know, developing where we are here in Toronto, is to model what we're doing, is to capture that, both in terms of you know, uh, understanding that we want to um, share, pe share our learning with other communities, but also keep it flexible and open enough that it can, it can grow organically in, in the different cities and communities where, where it will land. Thank you. And, and can you share um, a couple of the lessons that you've learned um, and some of the takeaways that other folks in this space, um, either working in this space or interested in this space, can kind of learn from? 
Well, I think, you know, we're both a social uh, organization. We, we really provide early intervention, uh, onboarding in terms of wraparound services, language, and, you know, all sorts of uh, civil literacy, financial literacy now. Um, but we also, um, but we're also a social enterprise. And so, you know, it's a mashup. And, you know, we kind of know, we kind of know we're at the leading edge of something when, you know, the, we don't really fit into any boxes. And that tells you that you're kind of like, you know, you're moving into new space. And, and so the lessons learned is that, you know, to stay open, you know, if we pivoted every time we had an opportunity, we said kind of yes to everything. And we learned. And, uh, you know, we're having this moment now where with government funding, we can have a moment of reflection and start to sort of gather all the data together. And, and more importantly, we can bring on, you know, new women. And what's really fun is, is that the women who've been in our program now for a year and a half are going to become the leaders, the trainees, the mentors of the new women that are coming in. And that's, I think, for us, one of the most exciting aspects of our program. Awesome. Well, there's a lot from this project and a lot from the organization and the team, and I would love to go on and on about this. However, uh, we are actually cutting into the Q&A part, so uh, we promise to send more links um, about Newcomer Kitchen, and feel free to reach out to Cara um, if you wish to learn more. Um, but we're going to for now move off. Oh, sorry. So, before we go to the Q&A part, um, we're just going to tell you about um, some of the types of tools and resources that we will be sending you. Um, so this will be in the email that will come out next um, week. Um, we didn't want to go into all the tools um, on this because, frankly, we don't have the time, and I'm not so sure it helps um, for me to just read all the description of these. So we will send these, and also if there are any tools, resources, platforms, anything that you guys have personally found useful that you would like to share with other fellow participants on the line, please, please send me an email um, by end of this weekend so I can include it in our um, package. And so that's me, Yasmin, and we're going to open up to questions. Um, and so I'm just going to start. So. One of the first questions um, was about um, learning and where, um, in, a, in, a, in a place where um, most people are thinking linearly, how do we get people to think and act more in the systems way of thinking? Um, and some of the resources, I'm just going to copy paste it into the little chat box. Um, we will be sending these resources um, later, um, but I'm going to send them for now as well. Um, so Waters Foundation is a fantastic um, place um, for people to go and get more resources. Amazon um, has um, the book Systems Thinking, which helps you go into this. If you're thinking more for the, um, like the kindergarten to age um, to 12, grade 12, um, there, um, there's actually the Peter um, Senge organization is working on this. Um, and there's various different ways to teach it, to play with it. And one of my favorite books, which is about um, systems thinking playbook, book. It talks about different games that you could do as a group um, to learn about systems um, thinking. So this will help to kind of have those wheels um, turning um, to learn more about how to solve um, complex problems. So the next question is, um, going back to when you talked about um, the chart, how important is it to understand where we are now before we explore where we want to be. Um, so this, um, as, as you saw, if, if I could go back to the cold example, um, it is extremely important because if, if people don't understand why are we in the position that we are. Um, so if I got sick in the past because I wasn't taking care of myself, I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't healthy, I was stressed out, I was getting two hours of sleep at night. If I don't understand why am I in the situation that I am, then I don't know which behaviors I have to change. And, and this is just me and my cold, but when we look at um, complex problems, um, most of us are in silos. 
and we don't necessarily understand the perspectives of the other sides and we don't understand what are the challenges and the unintended consequences that are happening and why are they happening. So this is really, really important um, and, and the book thankfully goes really, really into detail about it and how to leverage that to really go into the different mental models um, to understand it and then um, build that trust, build that responsibility and then come back and um, address the questions. How do you feel we should be involving low-income people ensuring they have a sense of responsibility to help themselves and making a commitment, helping them have some ownership? Well, I certainly think that, you know, we try to have the voices in our organization of all the different stakeholders and participants. Now, you know, in terms of low income, you know, one of the things that we've discovered is, is that, you know, we, there's a systemic problem, there's a government policy problem. And so many of the women uh, who are in our program are still in government systems, and that's the way it should be. At the moment, they're still um, adjusting to Canada, and they're doing English classes every day. Uh, there are many reasons why they need to continue to be in government assistance. But the cap of government assistance in terms of what they can earn above and beyond that, we believe is too low. Because it keeps them in a cycle of, essentially a cycle of poverty instead of like growth to prosperity. And so we were putting together something called the Collective Impact um, um, Project, where we bring stakeholders at a very high level, a meta level, government, you know, uh, um, academic uh, um, people who for whom this is their uh, specialty and we're starting to really try to nudge the government to look at raising the cap of how much people can earn so they can actually engage in the economy while still having the necessary supports that they need and so they want to engage you know they absolutely want to participate we need to allow them to participate more while still giving them the social assistance that they need Perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to go into the next question. Sorry, my phone monitor jumps up and down. Um, so the next question is, when an initiative focuses on a specific ethno-cultural population, what strategies tools can be used in the context of systems change? Well, I think that, you know, I had a background in anthropology, and so we were always trained to sit, to watch, to listen, and that if you didn't take that time, that you would miss things that you wouldn't even understand. And so I was glad that in many ways, in using that kind of system thinking approach, you know, even though, you know, we've done an awful lot, in many ways, you know, I've sat back and tried to really um, observe and to capture and allow the cultural norms and the social norms to come to the surface and to be, to, to really uh, help um, design and shape the experience. And so there are many, many ways in which we do that. Um, but I think it's absolutely critical. It's certainly critical when you're dealing with a population who, um, you know, are coming from a very different kind of culture and they're coming to a very strange culture. You need to allow them to bring their own identity, their own norms, their, their own uh, ways of doing things into that organization and we've done that and it's totally you know it's totally the joy of our organization is, is that it does reflect so, uh, in so many ways in, in, in nuanced ways in very big ways um, the people that they are perfect thank you and I think that lesson can also be taken to other um, contexts of, as, as well. Um, I'm just going to go to one, one last question and then we um, are unfortunately going to have to call it. Um, and the last question is, how long do you think it takes to get into systems thinking and beyond that acting? It seems like you would need to commit to this path and may need some training and get there over a period of time. And I'm just going to give my short comment and then I'm going to switch it to Kara. Um, and I think it's like anything else. Um, we don't have to be, you know, Peter Venge with 20 years of experience and many books before we start to talk about it, I think. It's like the piano player, the concert piano um, player who starts to learn um, to play. And they play in front of people and they work on it, they improve on it, eventually it becomes um, second nature. 
Um, but I think if we start to think about these, um, and, and as it was mentioned before, um, give the space for the people to make mistakes, to learn, to change it, and put it as part of their process. And when I give it to Kara, as she's the one um, living and breathing this right now, if you want to add well, anything. But you know, Yasmin, you know, when I met you and you started to really shape my thinking and you started to articulate it, you know, yes, we jumped in the pool, yes, we were doing systems thinking, but you have really helped us clarify our thinking in such a big way and so I'm, I'm so grateful for that because it is a little bit of, you know, theory and practice. They have to come together. And um, so, you know, I think... I do think you have to jump in the pool, and the only way to, uh, you know, change things is to act. Uh, but at the same time, you also have to mm, allow the path to develop, and you have to watch, and you have to listen, and you have to make decisions along the way in terms of where that path is taking you. But again, in systems thinking, it takes you back to those fundamental values, and those values of open listening, open heart and open well. I thought you said that so beautiful, Yasmin. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't think I can wrap it up any better than that. Um, hopefully you guys had some takeaways. If you have um, any questions for either Kara or myself, please um, email us. We will be sending the presentation. And I'm going to hand it back over to Natasha to wrap it up for us. Thank you, Yaz, and thank you, Kara. Uh, you couldn't see me in the background, but I was nodding furiously uh, when you were talking about, you know, diving in, but having an open heart, open mind, absolutely. We've been talking about that re uh, quite a bit recently on some of our other communities of practice calls, so thank you for bringing that uh, to us today here. I just wanted to um, ask everyone on the line to stay in touch with Vibrant Community, Cities Reducing Poverty. Um, you can receive the latest thinking, news, and tools uh, from around the poverty reduction community by subscribing to our bi-monthly uh, newsletter, Cities Connect, or you can visit the, the online learning site for poverty reduction practitioners at www.vibrantcanada.ca. If you jump to the next slide, Allison, um, this is the last call for uh, the Big Community Change Institute happening in Vancouver. Um, you will you will join Yaz here um, at the event as well as our entire Tamarack faculty. Um, it's going to be a five-day event that will be truly transformational. Um, you'll learn about collective impact, community engagement, uh, collaborative leadership, social innovation, and more. So. We've just released the workshop, uh, the workshop registration, so people are starting to sign up and build their schedules. If you're thinking of coming to this one, please do register now um, and join, join in the fun. We will send you the link in the follow-up email. Um, and then finally, just a big thank you from us once again, uh, Yaz, Kara, and everybody on the line. In a few days, you will receive our follow-up email, and we'll include the link to the audio recording, as well as the links uh, to the different learning opportunities I've just mentioned, and all of the ones that uh, Yaz mentioned as we went. Uh, you can email me, natasha at tamarackcommunity.ca, to provide your feedback about today's webinar. We're always trying to improve on the experience. So thank you once again for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon.